Welcome one and all. Um, this is CST CST 8215. Um, that it's my first time teaching level once. I've taught this course for years, but it used to be a level two course. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of an adjustment uh, because they've decided to merge this database course with the database course for CP and others. So that means that uh, there's, the content has changed a hair from what I'm used to teaching and we're actually using a textbook I'm not used to, so there's going to be some interesting experiences for everybody. Um, the textbook we're using is not showing up on Textidium yet, I'm surprised. Textidium is working so well this year. Um, as a pilot project, it's not. Um, now, I can get my slideshow to cooperate. All right, I'll give you guys a bit of background on who I am and why you should listen to me. Um, so it's something some profs don't do. Um, I graduated from college. I'm not a university guy, so I was in your shoes in 93. It's been a while. <laughs> Um, I am a professional developer. I've been working as a professional developer since with maybe a hiatus of maybe a month in the last 20 years. Um, I work full-time and I teach part-time. What does that mean for you guys? It means that I'm current. It means that I'm not as set in the educational approaches that some of the other profs may have. Um, just because I teach part-time doesn't mean I don't care though. I, I do. Um, I work for a company called Catlink Technology. Nobody's ever heard of them. We're not very big. I think we've got maybe 50 employees worldwide. Uh, but we work for all kinds of cutting edge stuff. So, you know, interesting. Uh, what kind of person am I? I'm usually loose and easy going. I am sarcastic. It's a personal flaw that entertains students usually. Um, I also understand that life happens. I will not get on your case if you suddenly start puking and can't make it to class. Such is life. Um, but by the same token, I don't have a lot of patience for idiots. Um, by idiots, I don't mean people that aren't clever. I mean people that are clever that choose to not be clever. Um, so if you show up for the third time saying, I can't hand in my son because my dog barfed on it, and then my cat barfed on it, and then I barfed on it, I'm not going to buy it on the third buy. That's pretty much how it is, you know. I'm pr fairly patient, I got a lot, a lot of humorance, but I, it goes so far. Um, and as you can see, the last line is I'm an equal opportunity offender. Uh, one of the side effects of not being an institutionalized teacher is I've picked up some bad habits over the years. Um, my language is not always the best. I apologize now. Um, I try to keep it under control, especially considering, as you can see, there's a little camera here, I record my lectures. It's not good to have too much evidence. Um, and that also means I'll probably pick on people lightheartedly. Uh, but, you know, I will basically ins manage to insult everybody in here at least once. Don't take it personally, that's just how I am. Um, but that being said, that also means that, you know, I'm, I can take a beating too. So. It goes both ways. We just don't cross certain lines, and we're all good. Um, the other thing that comes with that, um, how can I word it properly? Yeah, I've, I've, I've done this presentation you know, 14 times. I think I'd have this memorized by now. Um, essentially, we're just going to try to get along, right? So it's all good. All right, this is the textbooks you're supposed to have. Right now, there's another textbook showing up in Textidium. The teacher that decided to be in charge of this course, since I've only been teaching it for five years and they gave it to someone else to manage, when they merged it across different programs, he decided that was a textbook we're going to use. And then there's another textbook to decide you guys are going to have uh, that you need for two chapters. And I looked at the chapters and they're not very useful. <laughs> so, unfortunately, you guys. Have you know, it's been included in your pile of books. Um, but this is the one we're going to use. Uh, I checked out in the hall for walking to the classroom and it has not shown up at Texidium yet. And it doesn't show up when you get your digital resources. Uh, it was promised to us mid last week. 
Um, warning you now, it's a droid book that tries to be funny. Uh, it doesn't succeed. Um, it is the exact same textbook I used, except I used the second edition when I was in college. Okay, I've been tortured by this book. And it wasn't any funnier back then. And it, actually, a lot of the jokes are still the same jokes. <clears throat> so, that being said, it is a good book. It covers material fairly well. Um, I'll be explaining how you guys are going to use it specifically for this class. I'm taking a different approach to the use of the textbook compared to some of the other props. Um, that's how it is. Okay. Now, there's always rules for success, right? Well, in my rule, I have my own rules for success. Okay, come to the lecture. And I say, what about that attendance? As you notice, I didn't, I didn't send an attendance sheet out. Um, essentially, I try to take attendance after the first week because, you know, life happens. This is my first week, except for one lab last week. So this is week one. I'm going to pretend this is week one for me. Um, starting next week, I will be passing an attendance sheet around for a couple of weeks. Once again, I'm drawing your attention to my little camera there. I record my lectures, um, which means that if you can't make it in because you are not feeling well, um, and I mean by not feeling well, I mean the flu or cold or something transmittable, being hungover does not count as feeling well. Um, I've been there. <laughs> hey, I'm still there sometimes. Okay, like really? Um, if you're sick and you're transmittable, don't come to class. Just fire me off a note. I'm not going to care. Honestly, as long as you watch the video to catch up on the lecture, all is good. Um, do your work. That should come as a no brainer. <clears throat> Apparently, it isn't. Uh, rule number three, hand in your work on time. Being this is where one of the impacts of me working full time outside of teaching impacts you guys. I don't have a lot of time for hunting people down for their work. Essentially, I sign a due date. I will announce at the start of the class, by the way, this should have been handed in today. And if it's handed in that day, congratulations, you win. If you don't get it in that day, you have one more week. You take a 10% penalty because you're late. If you're more than a week late, you get zero. And it's not negotiable unless you actually spoke to me beforehand. And there's something in writing between you and I that there's a reason why you couldn't get the work done. That's actually a, what I call a real life rule. Where I work, if you don't deliver the, the project to the customer in time, we start paying, we start discounting our work. So a six figure contract suddenly becomes a five figure contract. And then other people get upset usually my boss. So in real life, there's deadlines. They're enforced. There's penalties if you're late. I will treat this the same way. Whether you guys would be level one, level five, it's all the same. I've taught level one students before in a different program. I had the same rule then. We've all put on our big boy and our big girl pants. We've shown up for class. We can hand in our work on time. Okay. If you don't hear me sign it in class, it's not due. In other words, if it hasn't been recorded and there's no video evidence of me handing it out, hopefully my recording stuff works, um, it is not going to be due. I've had cases in the past where Blackboard decided to get clever. You guys are new with this. You don't really know how bad Blackboard can be some days. It has days where things happen kind of funny. Uh, it's gotten a lot better in the last two years, but before that, mm -hmm. randomly it would appear and disappear. My due dates would change without my knowledge or not show up at all. Oh, please. Um, now, labs are due by the start of the next lecture. That last one's going to change because uh, I'm still negotiating with my own brain about how I'm going to handle this. Um, but that's fine. Um, essentially, you have a week to do them no matter which way I decide to grade them. Labs that are late is an automatic zero. Why? Because my labs usually take 45 minutes to do. To an hour. 45 minutes to an hour. I allocate lab time so that if you're working on projects, you have a chance to talk to me about it. If you're working on your assignments, come and talk to me about your assignments. 
you're having a hard time getting through the lab, you can come and talk to me. You guys are one of the privileged few groups of CST 215 that has the same teacher for their lectures as for their labs. I think there's one other section that has mostly the same. All the others are all spread out. Howard's covering somebody else's labs, for example. Um, and he's covered my labs, it's pretty good, so. But you guys have me for all the labs, so that means that if you're having problems in the classroom, you can follow me to the lab. And it works. I've posted my lab, my lab times, my lab locations. Um, and I did correct them, because apparently I don't know how to read. Um, that means that if you can't make it in for your normal lab, feel free to show up for another lab. They're all grouped up at the start of the week. That's that. Um, but if your labs are late, you get nothing. All right, what can you expect this term? Uh, surprise, lectures, labs, assignments, tests, and it's a two-part final exam. We'll get into the details of that much later in the term. Uh, my lectures are free form. I don't tend to use cue card. I don't use lecture notes. I don't have those nicely formatted documents that some of the other profs that all they do is teach have. Um, so I don't use lecture notes. Don't ask for them. I don't have them. Uh, historically, I've come in with a little post-it note. That's what I've got to remember to talk about today. Um, labs are gradual and they peak in, in difficulty around week nine. They do this and then they level off. Uh, assignments submitted by a blackboard, and you usually give them at least two weeks. <clears throat> uh, usually they're not brutal. So again, no excuses. Uh, tests, so far the decision is I'm going to do them online due to a few different reasons. Uh, you will have a week to do them. Um, they normally take anywhere from half an hour to an hour long. Uh, I'm in the still in the middle of tweaking the first couple of tests because of the new textbook. So the timeline may vary a little bit. Um, but then again, I give you an entire week to do a test. Yes? Is it like once you start the test, you have a certain amount of time to finish it? Or yeah, and it's it save and resume. Oh, okay. It's all done on through Blackboard. Tests, you go in, you do it. You go, I assume you're not sitting with everybody else doing your tests. Because if I, I, it's happened to me in the past where I've walked through the hall and I heard people talking about the test as a group doing the test. And my test now is completely randomly generated. That means every one of you gets a different test. <laughs> right, there's 120 odd students and each test is pulling from a pool of close to 300 questions. The odds of you having the same test as someone else, pretty small. But if I do find people cluster together doing a test, the next, uh, next test will not be done online. It'll be done in the classroom. You're allowed to ask each other, do you understand what this is asking? Yes. Can you tell me what the answer is? No. I try to make it fair for everyone. <coughs> okay, that's that one little slide. Lecture recording, I try. I'm trying a new piece of software this term that I've never used before. Today is the test lecture, because the first lecture is not usually as important as the rest. If it works well, we'll continue using it. If it doesn't work well, we'll go back to what I was using before. Um, what happens is, after it's done recording, it will be processed and uploaded to Algonquin has a Camtasia relay server. And what it does is I upload my lectures to that. It grinds it to some magic format that Algonquin insists we use. And then I post a link in the lecture and then you can watch the, usually it takes me a day or two to get it up. Sometimes I have to edit it and add, you know, censoring. Um, <laughs> but you know. No, oh, that's not what I wanted to use. Okay, what will you be learning this term? You're going to learn basic database design. You're going to learn SQL. SQL is the language you use to talk to databases. You're going to learn about things called views, triggers, and store procedures. I can guarantee those three things won't show up until week 10. Just so you know. Uh, and other stuff. As I said, this course is being managed with five <coughs> other instructors. What's happening is one instructor has been tasked to write a final exam, and they're supposed to give us all the other teachers a copy, so we know what we're supposed to cover. So when I say other stuff, that's falling under the other stuff category. In case I suddenly get a copy of the exam, and I discover that's not even planned for today. 
Okay, how's the evaluation gonna go down? <coughs> Labs are worth 10%. It's not a huge percentage, but it's still significant enough. Quizzes, also known as hybrids, are worth 10%. Um, there, the quizzes, the hybrids are significantly more robust than they used to be. They used to be only worth 5%, so now it's moved up to 10%. Um, assignments, two assignments. You guys are lucky, I used to have four. But because we're doing a consolidated course, I have two assignments now. They're bigger than they used to be. There's only two assignments, they're worth 10% each. So I'm not doing one worth five, one worth 15, they're both 10%. There are two tests, at least. Uh, there's actually, actually have a third. Um, so that means that you take 20% divided by three and that gives you your, your test grade. I had to put down two because that's the minimum we're required to have. Uh, we have a final theory exam, 20%. People are saying, woo, woo the written exam is only 20%. Yes, it's only 20%. Uh, because you also have a practical exam during the last week of lab. That one's also worth 20%. The practical exam cover basically covers the, the fiscal application of what you've learned starting about week five onwards. Um, sounds about right, right after Thanksgiving. Um, it's what it starts covering is that. It's going to prove to me that you are physically capable of typing the stuff in and actually making the computer do what it wanted to do. That's how it is. Um, the, uh, the, this program, this course has only had a practical final for two to four. This will be term three. Four? Term three, having it. Uh, in the past, it's been rather successful. Uh, it gives a good chance for students that have a hard time with memorizing theory but are really good at get hands-on stuff to actually still get a decent grade in their final exam. <clears throat> or you got the other the theory exam for people that really can't apply but are able to memorize facts. That gives you a chance to get a good grade also. It balances out the final exam a little bit for both sets of learners. All right, this is a 323 course. Right, by now, you guys will know what this is. Now, this is the first time anybody actually explained to me what 323 was, was before this term started. They kept throwing it at us like we knew what it meant, the part timers. Used to me. Um, that means you got three hours of theory. That means two hours of me standing in front of the class talking, theoretically, <laughs> plus one hour of hybrid. You got two hours in class and one hour of it's online. All right, two hours of lab a week, three hours of study time. Now, by three hours of study time, that means you're supposed to review your notes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I've done is if the textbook ever shows up, and if it doesn't, I've got a PDF copy I can share you, with you from my library. Sure. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you guys reading assignments. That's essentially your study time. Unlike some of the other profs where I say read page five, paragraph three, and read page eight, paragraph four kind of thing, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you read page 125. I'm gonna get your money's worth out of these textbooks. I hate textbooks. So therefore, if I hate them, I may as well make you, because I don't find the value of them unless you use them completely. So I'm gonna make you guys use these textbooks to the, to the max. Um, and the one hour of hybrid, is actually you guys writing a quiz every week on what you read. Uh, right now, if everything works right, I gotta double check on my settings. Uh, you get two tries at each hybrid. You get try one, you don't like the grade you got, you get to try the second time. I will keep the better of the two. The hybrids are random. Questions also. And it's not the same style of questions as the tests. The hybrids are filling the blanks. That means you've actually taken the time to go look for the answers in the books. And maybe read. Because not all the questions you can just control F and find the answer. Some of them you can, some of them you can't. So the three hours of study time is me giving you something boring to read. Which realistically should take about an hour to read. I'm giving you three hours to do it because you know I'm sure guarantee you're gonna fall asleep doing it. <laughs> but that's just and I can't help it, right? 
All right, here's the official to pass the course. Right here, you had dance rules, unofficial rules for success. These are the official ones. You gotta write the final exam. You don't show up for the exam, you automatically fail. You might be sitting at a 90% writing total before writing the final written final exam. You don't write it. EFB, I'll see you here in January. <coughs> okay, you gotta get at least 50% in everything. Wow. 50% on tests and 50% on assignments. In other words, if you have 50.1, you pass the course. Believe it, I've seen 49.9. Was not a good day when I was trying to find two points for this person because I just didn't see the point of having them back to, for 0.2%. Um, and you must also complete and submit both assignments and all labs. That's the official rules as put down by our different departments. Um, such as life, you gotta at least try to do the work. If you submit the assignment, and you submit me basically a blank page with name on it, congratulations, you submitted an assignment. You get zero, but hey, you got your assignment in. You got the minimum requirement, right? Uh, no, don't do that. That's just that. I'm just saying, technically you handed in your assignment. Okay. These are the assignment and test due dates. They are not written in stone. Okay? Just putting it out there. Just like some people talk, read the CSI, it'll give you all the important dates. Sure, it'll give you all the important dates, assuming nothing goes wrong and that there's no surprises. Okay, October 24th and November 21st are the two assignment due dates. The test one is planned for the week of October 3rd. Theoretically, if we've covered the material. Test two is planned for the end of October. As you notice, there's nothing in November, test-wise. Why? Because you're getting slammed by all the other profs. I'm selfish. I'd rather you focus on my tests than just my tests. So I've made your mind fall in between everybody else's tests. Okay. So that's the short and long of what to expect out of me. And by now you've already seen what kind of personality I have and you're all crying on the inside. Um, now I'm going to start going to the lecture. Does anybody have any questions about in general, before we get going. Anybody? Going once, twice. You always see you're supposed to say, oh, there's one. Uh, where can we find the recordings? They will be on Blackboard in a section called Recordings. Yeah. I will set, every time I post, mm -hmm. I'll post the announcement with the link to the, to the page. Yes. Do you have, um, can we get like, the slideshows on? I Blackboard? will be putting them up also. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you know, you said we got two tries in the... On the hybrids. Yeah, is it two tries each hybrid or two tries in like the whole hybrid? No, 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 no. No, each hybrid is set for two attempts. Last time I checked it, if Blackboard has not eaten my settings. But I will be double checking them later this week to make sure everything's kosher. Um, now, due to the fact that the textbooks have not shown up, I'm assuming none of you have seen that MDM book yet up in your list of textbooks in Textidium? Good. No, not good, but good. At least I'm not the only one because I'm sending um, specially worded messages to the course coordinator. Where are, my te where are my textbooks? And I wanted to make sure I wasn't being a jackass. All right, next one. All right, so this is where the real content comes in. Just gonna make sure this is still recording. Oh, it's still recording, it's recording the right screen. Good, good. Okay, now if you have the textbooks, this, this is part of the slideshows that come with the teaching material for this textbook. And I took the time to rip it to pieces and rip out pieces I thought were irrelevant. I don't have time to go through a 72 slide slideshow. Consider most of it's just copy paste from the textbook. That's why I'm making you read it. But I'm going to cover the material. Okay, the objectives of the first chapter of that book is you're going to learn the definition of the different terms. 
you are going to be able to discover the limitations of file processing. Now, file processing is what used to happen. Uh, explain the advantages of using a database. Identify the costs and the risks of using databases, because there's risks with everything. List the components of the database environment. In other words, can you tell me what the bits and pieces are that make up a database environment? All right, some definitions. A database is an organized collection of logically related data. Now, oh, there's a nice mouthful. Let's back that up a little bit. A database is essentially a picture of filing cabinet. I mean, anybody here ever work with an account? Anybody here know an account? Wow. First one, thank you. Two, three, whoo! Man, I'm starting to get scared. This is going to be the first group that never met an account. <laughs> Accounts are anal retentive. They like to organize their data. They love paper. They love filing cabinets. Our accountant where I work has 17 filing cabinets in his office. And they're all nicely organized. He's got a system. What happens is with a database, it organizes the data for you if you design it properly. It manages it for you. It makes sure that things behave the way they should. And usually the data makes sense and it's logically connected to each other. Data. Data is the stuff that's stored in the database. Um, in other words, meaningful objects and events. For example, each of you is a meaningful object. Congratulations, you now have meaning. Yay! Yay. I'm sure I found at least three people in here on that line. Um, but that's, you know, but you all have meaning. The things you do every day going to class have meaning. That is all data. How many of you have got real phones, like Android phones? How many of you have Apple phones? For you. <laughs> okay. Um, for example, we don't talk about data that tracks you. <laughs> I like making fun of Apple products, sorry. <laughs> Let's remove our, our cell or earphone jack. <laughs> but, have you, any of you with the Android phones noticed this feature they now have called Timeline? No? Go, ex go explore your Maps app. And there's an option for Timeline. It tracks everywhere you've been through the day. And it'll put up on a map to show where you've been. It's a great way to, great way to show your significant other where you haven't been. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an event, right? As you're traveling from point A to point B, that's an event. Point B is a piece of relevant data. That is data. It's all information that you're collecting as you go. Usually, you end up with structured numbers and dates. There's unstructured data such as images and video, uh, documents, that kind of stuff. That's all data. Realistically, when you talk about databases, you're tracking numbers, text, dates, that kind of stuff. Uh, the binary type stuff as images and video, you don't tend to track that in the database per se. You track it, yes, but not interestingly inside the database. Uh, information. is data has been processed to improve the knowledge or increase the knowledge of the person <coughs> using that data. Now, what does that mean? That means that somebody took the time to track all the GPS data from your phone and put it up on a map. And it, it's very enlightening when you realize that how much time you spent driving around in a week. Because you can calculate it using that fun functionality. Um, that kind of stuff. Then there's metadata. That's the data that describes the properties in the context of the user data. For example, the metadata of each and every one of you in here. You have a name. You have a date of birth. I oh. hope. Uh, you have a SIN number of some sort, depending on where you come from, it's called something else. Social insurance, social insurance number, social security number, insert whatever it is where you come from. There's different names for it. Essentially, it's a unique identifier that the government says you are who you are. That's metadata. In other words, these are properties that define you as an individual. If you're at the college, you all have a number. It's your student identification number. Congratulations. You have a piece of metadata that identifies you uniquely to the college. All right, on this slide, there is a bit of information. It's a simulated class roster. 
I'm just going to aim my camera over a little bit so I can stand next to the screen. Please don't crash. Okay, so we got a class roster. On this, there's a ton of different information when you look at it quickly. It might not look like much, but for example, you got information about a course, the course code and the name of the course. You have a semester. Right now you guys are in 16F. For example, section two. Well, this one here is section 300. There's five, I think six sections of uh, CST and EQ15 this term. There's lots of you. Then you've got some information about each person. You've got, you've got names, you've got IDs, you've got whatever their, their major is and their GPA. This one needs to apply to something as well. That's example, that's context of data. It's all data. If you only were given is a piece of paper with this information on it, unsorted in just lines, you'd have no idea what the context is. But when you look at it that way, you have context. You can at least maybe start breaking it down and understand what data, the data is for. Okay. You can also make, and now it's not showing up anymore. Really? There we go. PowerPoint doesn't like it when you switch between apps very much. It gets a little upset with you. <laughs> Just my wife gets mad at me when I keep starting my phone. Because <laughs> I'm not paying attention to what's going on. For example, there's some graphs. Somebody took some data and made pretty pictures out of it. Pictures are always easier to understand than raw text. The human brain is wired to understand imagery, not symbols. We just teach ourselves on how to do it when we're little, so our brains are wired for it. But we're not naturally wired. We understand graphs much quicker visually. You know, Apple shares. <laughs> Wait, so that's the same date they released the phone. That no, your phone jack the same features Android had two years ago. <laughs> you know, just the same. Um, graphical displays will tend to turn data into useful information because that way it makes more sense to you. Okay, now this is sample metadata. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm going to spend more time later. But this just shows you some examples compared to that first little table we had. Um, the course section, for example, the course is an alphanumeric. It's a string. It's got a name. They gave it a minimum length. When you start working with data, you'll notice that you have to describe your data in detail. In other words, you look at a piece of paper. And there's all kinds of information on said piece of paper. And you're going, now I've got to put this into a database. Well then, I guess I've got to figure out what the sizes of everything is. Um, one of the reasons they chose to move this course earlier is to give you guys a chance to start developing your data design skills. Uh, in Java, you're required to define data types through variables. Obviously, I'm talking words you haven't probably heard yet. But with databases, it goes past that. It forces you to be organized, or forces you to be tidy and properly sorted out. And it forces you to actually think about what the data is you're working with, as opposed to just opening up a can, throwing stuff in it, and going. How many of you are tidy thinkers? By tidy thinkers, you walk into a room and, for example, if you walked into my office at my day job, you walk in there and go, whew, this place is clean. Why? Because I like things tidy, I like things organized. You walk into my junior's office and you want to throw up because it's so messy. He's a disorganized thinker. People that succeed well at database work tend to be organized thinkers where you start segregating your data in smaller chunks. You think about the small pieces. Don't worry about the big piece yet. Worry about the small pieces, then assemble a large piece. Okay, file processing. This is a piece of historical information. Before we had database systems, we had file systems. Data was stored in physical files. 
And the problem then, what would happen is you had um, issues. For example, each file was defined by the program that used it. So that means that inside the program itself is the structure of the file. That means that if somebody makes a mistake in the program, congratulations, the file's not going to work. You had duplicated data. So you had a customer system. You had an ordering system. You had an invoicing system. Now, what would happen is each of these systems would each have its own copy of the customer data. Now, remember just a few seconds ago I talked about the data dependence? So the team developing the customer management portion of the software would make a change to the file structure and not tell any of the other teams. What do you think happens to the next build of the other pieces of software? It breaks. That means that all the teams are, have to keep each other in sync. And all the different applications each need to have the same definition of the data. And that means that, let's say you had a 20K file. I know what 20K doesn't sound big to you guys nowadays, but 20K of text is a lot of information. Now, take that 20K file and copy it to four other locations. Now, how many K of text do you now have? 80K. And it's all the same information. And each one of them needs to keep each of the other in sync. That's just how things were done back in the day because we didn't have database systems. There was no there was limited data sharing. For example, the invoicing system didn't know anything about the customer system. There was a process that would actually copy the files chunk, 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 every night and actually synchronize the changes between them. But the invoicing system wouldn't know anything about the customer management system. Everything lived in its own little bubble. And this led to lengthy development times. Obviously, if each system doesn't know anything about the others, and everything something goes wrong, you end up spending three times as long as necessary trying to figure out what the problem is. And then you had excessive program maintenance. Now, a lot of people don't realize that 80% of an IT department's budget is usually maintenance. By maintenance is paying people to sit around waiting for something to go wrong. Back in the day, those guys were busy all the time. Why? Because the systems tended to break a lot. It's just how it behaved. Unfortunate, that's how it was. Nowadays, that percentage dropped a little bit because systems are a little more seen. Okay, I'm going to go through the, the bad parts, continue to explain the bad parts in a bit more detail. So, problems data dependency, that meant each piece was dependent on its own program. Uh, each application programmer must maintain each his or her own data. That means that I've seen this. I worked for a company that was in the middle of migrating away from file systems to databases. Even though database systems have been around for 15 years by then, they were still using the file systems because it worked. And what would happen is each application developer had to maintain their own files. There's actually entire sections of the program that didn't use the same file format. Not only did they not have shared data, they didn't even have the same format. And the one who was using CSV files with commas, another one using tab delimited. That meant that everybody had to write special handlers for each other's files, it was stupid. Um, each program needed to know everything about every other file it would ever use. That meant that you would grab code from application A, put it in application B. Dude would make some changes to it. Suddenly a guy in application A needs to grab the code from application B. You can see how this is starting to be a roundabout, never-ending cycle. Um, each program back then used to have its own routines for reading, inserting, updating, deleting data. That meant that as I was writing my code, I wrote my own version of find this record, delete this record, find this record, change this record. I wrote my own code to do it. It was horrifying. Uh, because we didn't have the internet, there was no stack overflow. So we couldn't just search online and say, how do we do this? What you normally end up doing is walking down the hall to the dark office, the guy with the beard down his beard, and ask him how he does it. 
And then he'd look at you, there's some Cheeto dust. And then he'd look at you and say, dude, I'm not telling you. It's called job security. Figure it out yourself. Oh. Yes, I've been, actually been at that almost like exact circumstance. Although the guy had a nice tie and everything, but you know, it wasn't it wasn't the long neck beard bit. It was just that kind of attitude. Um, there was a lack of coordination and central control. That means that the data is not controlled by one application. It's controlled by all the applications. And each of these different bits and pieces interacted with the data. You never really knew what was happening. And then you had non-standard file formats. CSV files were a gift, even if it was just tab delimited versus comma delimited. If you were using, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Some guys would actually binary encode their files. Some of them would store everything base64 encoded. Why? Because they didn't want people to actually read the file format of their files. You know, the guy in the office next to them people had to be able to read it. They didn't want to tell them. They'd say, use my, my API. Problem is redundancy. I already covered this pretty much in detail, but redundancy, redundancy wastes space. There's duplicated data. It breaks things. Maintenance nightmares, especially when the files get out of sync. Uh, where I'm working now, for example, for a while they're using an access database for text port. So you actually had five people accessing an access database at the same time. People think, yeah, I can't be that. Yeah, it was bad. I right, once in a while the computer would crash because you know computers were flaky and they still are. And then the database would lock, and then it'd go talk to the local IT guy, which wasn't me back then, to go in and recover the database. No text support for the next hour. Too darn bad. Um, the biggest problem is if you change the data structure of one file and you didn't tell the other guys. No, it's Friday. It's five thirty. and you're planning to go have something to drink, and you really want to get that job done, so you make that change, you save it, you walk out the door, come Monday morning, you forgot completely that you did it, and you don't tell any of the other guys, well then, bad days for you and everybody else, which in turn caused the data to get corrupted because the other guys wrote calls to those files and not the same anymore, and the files start getting eaten for breakfast. All right, so the solution is the database approach. And by the way, they actually had the exact same slide when I was in school. But we actually had, you know, the film with the overheads? But it was the exact same slide. The database approach. The database approach has a central repository of stored data. That means that there's a program running on a computer somewhere managing the data. That's its only purpose in life. It loves managing data. It knows nothing else but data. There's a controlling agent. Normally, depending on how you want to interpret the term controlling agent, it can be meant to mean a few different things. A, the software is controlling the data. It is under control of the software, and that software is the only thing allowed to change that data. That means there's not 20 programs hitting the data, there's one. Or a controlling agent could be a human being saying, none shall pass. <laughs> No, you're not allowed to touch this data. No, you don't have access to the raw database. Too darn bad. Put in a request to the development team, we'll find a way to fix it for you. There's two levels of that. And it's stored in a standardized, convenient form. Now, that's the line in the slide that I hate. Because like I said, I grabbed it out of the main teaching stuff, and it's actually covered in the book, and they use that phrase. Yes, it's stored in a standardized, convenient form. Sure. How is it actually stored on the disk? It's like voodoo. I'll be honest. It's a bunch of binary files. No two database servers files look the same, but they provide to you an interface that looks the same, essentially. Not the program you use, but the language you use to talk to the database server is more or less the same for all the different database servers. That's what they mean by standardized. I run a query, it gives me data. Congratulations, I win. Um, it saves a lot of grief. Okay, the database management system. I'll be putting up these slides after the lecture, don't worry. Um, a software system that is used to create, maintain, and provide controlled access to a user database. 
or user databases. It's a really good mouthful for essentially saying this is a program that you talk, the applications talk to to make sure that the data is managed. Um, I'm trying to find a really good real world example, but you know, mail order catalog stuff is getting there. Oh, for example, Canada Post. How many of you have had to go pick up a parcel at the mail mail post office recently? Or even here when you go pick up your books, for those of you that still have the physical books. You know, you go to that little, well, actually the room's not there anymore, but you go into the, into the student store, and go to the back and you ask at the desk, can you give me my books, or give me your proof of who you are, and they give you your books. They're sort of like a database management system. They manage the data that's behind them, and they provide to you an easy to interface, easy to interface, method to get your data out of them. That's essentially what a database management system is. It's a, it's a process, it's a program that provides a single point of contact for the databases behind it. It gives you a nice, neat, and by neat I don't mean cool, I mean neat as in tidy, way as to access the data. Um, usually, in this slide, you can see that it's broken down to a couple of things, right? You got an order filing system, an invoicing system, a payroll system. Those are different systems. They're all talking to a DBMS. The DBMS is a server. And I'm going to say one of the words that often come up at this point. For example, Oracle. Oracle is a database management system. Inside it resides a central database which contains all the information the external systems need. Oracle manages munching the data for you so that it's stored in a format that it understands and it's easy to move around. And when you ask for it, it gives it to you in chunks that are easy to work with. Um, most modern database management systems are what's called relational database systems. There's a few what they call post-modern modern systems, um, but for all intents and purposes, for this course, when I talk about a database management system, or a database server, or a server, that's many words, I'm talking about relational database servers. Okay, that's a really busy slide. It's awful. Um, but. This is the bits and pieces that make up the database approach. This is all in that textbook, and if it ever shows up, you guys will have lots of reading that have to do with these slides. Um, the data models. Data models are pictures. Um, I'll show you guys one in a moment. A data model is a graphical diagram that shows uh, either at high level how things are interconnected, or what they call a physical diagram, which shows you what the actual properties of the database are. Um, there's a project data model. What essentially what it does is it's somewhere between the physical model and what they call an enterprise model, which is the enterprise model is really basic. It goes and invoices related to a customer. That's all there is to that diagram. The customer has invoices. The project data model will say, this customer who has a name and an address has an invoice, which is an invoice number and a date. The physical one will say the guy's name is actually first name, it's a 50 character long string, last name is a 50 character long string, your address is a 100 character long string. That's the physical model. Physical model is very detailed. That's the ones you guys are going to be playing with the most. Details. There's entities. Those are, it's a noun form that describes a person, place, object, event, or a concept. And it's made out of attributes. For example, you guys are all entities. Congratulations. You're made up of uh, attributes. Names, sex, date of birth, social insurance number. Insert other things here. That's an entity. Another kind of entity would be an event. There is a curling game on next Saturday. That curling game has a certain location at a certain time. These are the things participate. That's all the details. Relationships. Those are connections between entities. 
I don't mean the boyfriend girlfriend kind of relationship. I'm talking the connection between two entities. For example, your connection at the school would be you are an entity. The courses you could take are an entity. The relationship is what courses are you taking? That's the relationship between the two. Um, usually, it's a one to many or many to many. That means that you are one can take many courses. Or many to many, which is many of you can take many courses. Sometimes there's one to ones. Normally, from my experience, when you start doing the one to one thing, it means that your your design needs some work. Um, there are valid reasons to do one to one, which means, for example, you can take one course and only one course. And once you take that course, no one else is allowed to take that course but you. You're sitting in a room by yourself, taking a course. That's a that's the example of a one to one relationship. Not very useful. It has purposes. For example, in a prison system, you put someone in solitary. They have a one-to-one -one relationship with their hole. They don't, they're the only ones allowed in that hole. That's a useful purpose. Sure, be ready. I'm just saying, that's an example of a one-to-one -one relationship physically applied. And then there's the relational databases. I just talked about that. Database technology uses tables, which are also known as relations or entities, and they represent uh, the data. Then there's keys. Uh, obviously, I'll be getting in a lot more detail what keys are starting next week. But essentially, in here, you all have at least two primary keys to identify you to the world, one to identify you to the government, one to identify you to the school. In actual fact, one of them applies both ways your social insurance number. Or if you're a foreign exchange student, your passport number, usually it's the number they're used to identify you, if I remember right. And then you've got um, your student number, which is your unique number at the school. No two of you have a dip, the same student number. Those are your primary keys as far as the school is concerned. Okay, big long slide. Essentially, if I were to go through this point by point, all it's saying is file systems suck, database servers are great. That's the summarized version of this slide. Database servers provide independence. That means you can have a server in the back <coughs> and have an application in the front that's written in C Sharp that does one job. You have something else written in PHP, serving up web pages, talking to the same database server. Congratulations, you don't have to create a new file format. You're just using a different API to get at it. You have another one written in Java. Do whatever the heck you're going to do with Java. And it's going to read in, in and out of the database also. It provides data independence. That means the data is independent from the applications. Um, you can plan for data redundancy. In other words, you can have database servers that replicate and copy itself. Proper backups. Improved data consistency. The server can be like that serious teacher that says, no, you will not do this. We've all had that teacher. Or as you're growing up, you know, and you're practicing your handwriting and you're doing those little papers and you write that A over and over and over again, somebody keeps correcting you, telling me you're doing it wrong. That's, you know, consistency. The database server makes sure that the data going in is always consistent. It doesn't allow bad data. Improved data sharing. Obviously, if you've got a central repository of all the data, all the different applications are sharing the same data. That means you're not copying the files from one file to another. Everybody's talking the same thing. Um, I like the way they word this one. Increased application development productivity. If you got one person whose job is designing the database and making sure the database is consistent, that means that each of the other developers don't have to learn about the database design. They just need to learn how to interface with the database. They can focus on their job, which is writing applications. As a database designer, you can focus on your job, which is making sure that the programmers don't screw up your data. I do both for a living, so, you know, I hate myself some days. 
very edgy. Um, now, it also enforces standards. The database server puts down the rules. Anybody here ever have to fill out a paper form where they didn't give you enough room for your last name? You got a big long last name, eh? Sucks, doesn't it? Well, the database server, on the other hand, if it was being punched in the database server, it might just say your last name is only allowed to be 10 characters long. Too darn bad. Shorten it up. Or you could pull in Australia where if you had a German name with umlauts, you weren't allowed to have umlauts in your name for a while. Really? I kid you not. Work with a co worker, her name last name was Pupo, without the umlaut. Because her parents moved to Australia and they had to get rid of all the special characters in their names. Because the rules were special characters. That was the standard. Improved data quality. If you can't put in garbage, the data is going to be better. Pretty simple concept. And the server, since it's enforcing standards, make sure you can't put garbage in. Can you imagine if you had a garbage can where you just took all your garbage, poured it in, it would automatically sort it to the right bins for you? Then you try to throw in, like, you know, your leftover chicken and it says, no, none of this new. Shoots it back out. <laughs> That's what it does. Reduce program maintenance. If you don't have to worry about maintaining the data files, guess what? It's one less thing you need to maintain. Thus, you can focus on what needs to be maintained. Fixing the bugs you created yesterday. And then improve decision support. That's like this, the cutest three words for saying making managers happy. Managers like data. They like creating reports. They like having pretty pictures that tell them that they're making money today. That's just what they like. What this does is if the data is centralized and it's not being spread out across multiple systems, they can run a single query and say, how many customers in Massachusetts ordered size seven men's shoes that are blue? Theoretically, you can write a query that gives you that information and they can say, well, we're not selling a lot of size seven blue shoes in Massachusetts lately. <clears throat> Maybe we should have a sale. Okay. <coughs> there are some costs and risks when it comes to the database approach. And this is a section in the textbook that they really have not updated in 20 years, to be honest. Uh, you need new and specialized personnel. That's been a fact now for 30 years. But they think it's like something new. Those are called database administrators, database architects, database designers. They're specialists. Or theoretically, they should be. A lot of us aren't. Uh, you just learn enough to get the job done. There's installation management and cost. And managing database server hardware is not like managing a Windows server hardware, managing Linux server hardware. Database servers, real database servers, tend to have a bit of a um, special requirement to the hardware. It's greedy about disk speed. It's greedy about how, fast, how much RAM you have. The requirements for a database server physically aren't the same as a, a typical web a Windows server, because Windows server doesn't need a lot of horsepower. It just need fast disks. Believe it or not, some of the best database servers tend to be gaming machines. Why? Lots of RAM, fast CPUs, and fast hard drives. Don't care about the video card, but the rest of it's all good, it's all the same. My laptop is a database server. It runs database servers all the time. It runs them fine. Also, overpowered. Um, conversion costs. By today's standards, this is almost non-existent. Um, there is only two segments of the industry now that this applies to, maybe want to take a guess what the two segments of industry would be there, there's still conversion costs involved. Converting from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things. Anybody want to take a guess what the two segments are? I think that's number one. That's number one. <laughs> well, not just that. If it works, don't spend money on it. Segment number two. There might as well be a government. Banking. Bank of Montreal is still running on COBOL servers. Why? Because it works. A bank doesn't work, but their servers work. 
I'm, I'm a BMO, BMO customer, you know, but uh, you know, it's one of those things. Um, just saying, banks are slow to change. Governments are slow to change. It's just how it is. There is such a big cost in migrating your stuff from the old to the new, that often they'll say, it can wait another two years. We'll let the next government worry about the upgrades. Because, you know, when they try to rush, you end up with something like Phoenix. Not cool. Um, you need explicit backup and recovery, which is a stupid explanation. Yes. Can RAID just fix that? For explicit backup and recovery? Yeah. Sure. Until a bus drives to your data center. <laughs> Where, where's your backup now? <laughs> Hey, <laughs> no, but that's life as a database, as a network administrator, and as a database administrator, that's like the first thing uh, at work we call it the pipe. Why? Because at our old location, we didn't know this, the plumbing of the upstairs men's bathroom went right over our server room. One day, somebody used to do a toilet paper, and the pipe broke on over top of our rack. Which had the backup server in it. Not the one other thing else, the backup server cooked. And basically the drives were fried. And thus, the backup server was dead. The main server was fine. The main stuff was fine, but we ran for three weeks with no backup server until everything was brought back up to snuff. So you need explicit backup and recovery plans. Normally that means you have an on-site backup for quick recovery and an off-site backup for you know, while well, the building is toast. Uh, then you have organizational conflict. This is a fun one. That's when you have one department fighting with another department saying, we want to be in charge of the database. It's the new shiny toy. I don't know why that's even an important thing anymore. But it used to be really, actually you still get in the government, right? We have one department saying, no, we'll take care of all this. The technology, the other part says, no, we want to maintain it ourselves because we don't trust you. All right, the components of the database environment. Now, you've got database administrators, system developers, and end users. So those are all the people sitting at computers, typing away, doing what they do, clicking here, clicking there. They usually have a user interface. The developers are creating new interfaces. The users are complaining about the interfaces. The database administrators are complaining about the developers because they can't make an interface the users will use. I talk from experience. I've been in all three seats. So you got a user interface. This user interface manages stuff. It'll start, there's application programs. There's database modeling happening. In other words, you've got the, app, the designers looking at the user interface, creating new interface designs, and stuff like that. Data goes into the database server and gets stored inside the database. They're all the bits and pieces. And we're on our last slide for now, today. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more after this, but this is the last slide for today. Um, Data modeling and design tools. You guys are going to learn to use data modeling tools as part of this course. Now those of you who were lucky enough to have the lab last week, congratulations, you already have your data modeling tool installed. It's called Toad. When are you going to use this term? Toad is a commercial product. They give it out for free for students, and you get to use it for six months for free. It normally sells for about 500 bucks. So free for six months is a good thing. Uh, repository. We're not using one here. Um, usually it's for version control. <coughs> Make sure that you have designs and you're sharing amongst all the developers. Uh, at most you're going to be sharing with this class is groups of three or four. So repositories aren't going to be that important. Database management systems. It's a software to manage the database. As soon as I'm done with this slide, I'll be talking about the one you guys are going to be using for this term. The database. That's the actual storage of the data. User interface. Theoretically, it's a program you use to click. Nowadays, most of them are web-based. Doesn't mean that's great that they're web-based, it just means most of them are now web-based because everybody thinks web-based is the way to go. 
Um, data and database administrators. This is the people making sure the database and the databases, the database servers are working properly. These are the people that have contained the keys to the kingdom. They're like network security people. Network security people are anal retentive about who's allowed to connect to the network. Database administrators are anal retentive about who's allowed to connect to the database server. We get really antsy when people start having touching the data in a non-controlled manner. It gives us the heebie-jeebies. Um, system developers. All of us in this room at some point in our lives hopefully will be system developers. These are the people that write programs. They usually talk to the database server. End users. They're the ones sitting on the other side of the desk from you. They're the ones using your programs. They're the turnips. If you can make it to a turnip and use your program, congratulations, you're going to make the end users happy. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about two different things. One is I'm going to show you guys roughly what a diagram looks like really quick. Obviously, you're going to make your own if my computer cooperates. Hello? Okay, this is a really tiny little model. Come on. Essentially, it just shows you what objects are in the database and their properties. It's, they're fairly straightforward. It looks like a definition of data. It includes what kind of this one here has users and reports and device types. There's there's different properties. So each of these are attributes going down and these are the properties after the name, the data type, and some other rules. That's essentially what a physical diagram looks like. These are these are what you're going to be pumping out for the first third of this term. Just so you know. Come on. All right, this is where you're going to be spending another chunk of your terms in this application. This is a, an administrative interface to a database server. Um, the database server we've chosen for this course, and the good news is for you guys, as opposed to the other ones, in the other sections, is I'm the only prof that actually uses that Postgres for a living. We're using a database server called PostgreSQL. PostgreSQL is an open source database server. It's free to use. It's insanely powerful. Um, it's comparable to Microdata, the upper models of uh, programs of uh, Microsoft SQL Server. It comes in different tiers. It's comparable to one of the bigger packages. It's comparable to Oracle or DB2. Um, its programming language, not the SQL side of it, but their programming language behind the scenes, is 90% compatible with Oracle's. It's a good start. Um, how many of you have PlayStations? Not Xbox, PlayStations. Okay. So every time you log into the PlayStation Network, you're actually authenticating against Postgres server. Just so you know, the PlayStation Network is backed by, by a series of uh, customized Postgres servers. Uh, Postgres is the first database server in orbit. That's the main database server on the ISS. Same. Um, Yahoo, as irrelevant as Yahoo is nowadays, <laughs> Yahoo runs on Postgres. Um, there's tons of companies that run on Postgres. 
Now, what happens often though is I'll get people say, well, why aren't you using MySQL? This course years ago used to use MySQL. MySQL <laughs> is an okay product. It does what it does, and it sort of does it well. The reason why everybody knows about MySQL is that it's by default installed on pretty much every Linux server. You install Linux, the next thing you install is a LAMP stack which includes MySQL. Done. Three commands later, you've got MySQL installed on your server and everybody's happy. Anybody here host, host a website, like have their own websites on a hosting provider? Usually one or two. By default, I guarantee you, you get MySQL. Why? Because it installs by default. Everybody's comfortable using it. It doesn't mean it's a good product, it just means that it's everywhere. Right? It's a bit like, actually I have nothing against Windows, I used to, but I don't anymore. But it's a bit like Windows, right? You buy a PC, it comes with Windows. That's just how it is. Unless you buy a Mac, then it comes with whatever the heck that is. <laughs> <laughs> it's Unix, but it's okay. I, I just make fun of the Macs, really. I don't have much of an issue. I have a problem with their vision, not their products. Um, but that being said, you buy a PC, it comes with an OS, usually. That's pretty much what happened with MySQL, is you get a web server, it comes with MySQL. And then MySQL performs, and then you get popular, and then it crashes and burns. It's not good for heavy loads. So other people come up with other servers. In the 60s, University of either Berkeley or U University of California, had a product called Ingress. It was a commercial database product, non-relational. And they actually, people paid to use it because they had staff that would take the time to build a database server for every single flavor of mainframes that were out there. And each mainframe had its own programming language, its own database software that nobody else had. Everything was proprietary. And the guys at that university, they said, well, we're going to charge you for development time to make a centralized database server. That's the same roughly as everywhere else. That's how Ingress came to be. Then Oracle came along and created the first relational database server that was cross-platform. You bought it, they sent you a set of disks, you put it on, congratulations, no changes required because it ran on quote, quote, everything back then, anything that was a server. And then the people copy that off, you know, Microsoft SQL server showed, showed up to the party, Sybase SQL server showed up to the party, IBM DB2 looked at Oracle says, that's a great idea, we'll release a better product than we use it. If that's where DB2 came in. So then the sales for Ingress died because there was, it wasn't non-relational. It didn't have any inter proper interfaces. It was a great server, but it didn't go anywhere. So they released it to the world open source. It was called Postgres as in before it was Ingress, that's after Ingress, Postgres. Really clever. Uh, about two years after Postgres came out, it was still not being used anywhere because it was essentially useless. Um, somebody said, you know what would be really cool? There's this new thing called SQL. It's already been out for 10 years, but this new thing called SQL, if we put that in there, suddenly it becomes useful to everybody. And thus PostgreSQL was born. So the database product is called PostgreSQL. It abbreviates to Postgres. Um, it runs on everything. Um, I just don't have the slide to wait for, but I mean, I've talked, it runs on everything. Uh, for a while, I had a Postgres server running on my phone just for shits and giggles, because I could do it. <laughs> then I realized it was just not actually useful, but it was, I had run a Postgres running on my Android phone. It also happens to run on, it, for a while, IBM was using it side by side with uh, the database that pushes uh, Watson. They're using it as a secondary cache for Watson, for its stats. So it runs from your phone all the way up to big mainframes. Runs on everything. Uh, runs on Windows. And as of version 8, it runs natively on Windows. Before that was interesting. Um, on Windows, it's stable. It installs well. It's easy to use as long as you accept all the defaults or you know what you're doing. Has to be one or the other. Um, it runs on Macs, natively. Sort of, in a sandbox. 
So nothing else can talk to her. Um, so all the applications have to run in the same sandbox as the server. <laughs> um, but this is the interface you guys are going to be using. I'm going to be posting a document that gives you a little tour of this. So when it's time to actually use this, you guys are going to be uh, a little more comfortable with it. But this is a standard management tool. Almost every database server has a management tool with it. Uh, IBM has a good one. Microsoft's is fabulous. I really don't like giving props to Microsoft, but their SQL Server product is fantastic. Uh, the easiest to use interface that does absolutely everything you'd ever want. I think in my years of using Microsoft SQL Server, I had to drop the command line once, fix something. And it was just to rename a file because I couldn't do it through Explorer for some unknown reason. It wouldn't let me because it's a protected system file and the server wouldn't let me touch it. Don't know why. Um, it has all the usual features. This allows you to back up and restore. It allows you to run queries. It allows you to create tables, uh, quickly view data. And those of you that have done the lab have probably done something that looks like this. And it showed up on this window. There, there's data, for example. So Postgres is a good tool. You're going to have a hard time finding books on it. Good news is their online documentation is priceless. By far the best documented database online. Um, some other cool things about Postgres that you may, you may hear over the years. Ottawa has a conference every year, the only conference for Postgres in the world. Uh, it's every spring of the U of O. U of O students get to go for free, the rest of us have to pay. Go figure. Um, it's been going for uh, over 10 years now. Uh, last year they had something like uh, 9,000 attendees. Uh, there's three companies in Ottawa that support it. As in you give them money, they come and fix it for you. There's commercial support for it now. Um, government of Canada is starting to adopt it. So that's good news. Uh, for example, the I had a student two terms ago that was working for a department of government that was, that was actually using Postgres. What department was it? A brand new department, more tax dollars. Um, the department something Speaker of the House. I know a Speaker of the House now has his own department. And it, basically his job is making sure people follow the rules and they decide to have their own database and they're running Postgres. Um, okay. So the other things uh, you'll know that you need to know about this course, since I still got everybody here. Um, you'll notice that I'm done pretty early today, actually. Um, less than halfway through. I tend to keep my lectures short for a few reasons. Um, because I'm part-time, I share office space. There's four of us assigned to the same desk. So I don't tend to use my office very much. Um, that haven't been said. I do have office time, uh, but it's only by appointment. So book an appointment with me, then we'll go. I'm at the school Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesdays only. Um, so usually I'll try to book you either before or after my classes. Um, that's about it, actually. So my lectures are short. They're usually about an hour and a half is what they're at. I decided to just do the introductory, introductory crap out of the way now, including that, that history side. Um, hopefully the textbook shows up. I will let everybody know what's happening with that so you can get on the first hybrid. Um, oh yes, yeah, so I'll give you guys a quick tour of Blackboard so you know where things are since somebody asked a question earlier. Okay, here are the bits and pieces. Assignments, tests, hybrids, and recordings. Okay, the tests are going to show up when they show up. The assignments will show up when they do show up. Um, the hybrids are here. I need to shove on the descriptions. I, however, all the descriptions are in the CSI, which your required reading is. Um, I'm not going to assign the required reading as of this moment because you guys don't have the textbooks. 
<laughs> as soon as I find out the textbooks are available, I will be putting out an announcement what the required meeting is for the first hybrid. If you don't have the textbooks, you can't do the hybrids. So there's no point in me putting all the extra details in there right now. Um, <laughs> there's nine hybrids. 14 weeks, but nine hybrids. That means you have whatever, five extra days, extra weeks in there to actually get these hybrids done. I do recommend you do them lots of stuff in the course. It might go a little better for you. Uh, then you've got the labs. As you can see, the segments, the sections are really small. You've got uh, the announcements and the labs. Any announcements specific to the labs will show up in there. You submit all your labs to your section. So that means whatever other CST you need to do 15, you see your lab. That's where your stuff is going to be. All right. Everybody can run away.